Uh, Mr. Keating is about three minutes out. As soon as he arrives, we will, we will, uh, we will start this hearing. The Subcommittee on Europe, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, will come to order. The Chair would like to remind our guests today that demonstrations from the audience, including the use of signs and placards, as well as verbal outbursts, are a violation of the rules of the House. The purpose of this hearing is to discuss the Alexander Lukashenko authoritarian repression in Belarus 
and the brave efforts of Belarus's democratic forces in standing up to this dictatorship. We will also discuss Lukashenko's complicity in Russia's war in Ukraine. I'd also like to welcome, uh, for the first time, uh, Representative uh, Gabe Amo to the Subcommittee on Europe. Uh, this is Mr. Amo's uh, first hearing with the Subcommittee. I look forward to his participation at future Subcommittee events and meetings. I would also like to welcome the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Smith, who is joining us today. He will uh, participate following, following all other members in today's hearing. I now will recognize myself for an opening statement. Alexander Lukashenko is an illegitimate dictator. The fraudulent 2020 Belarusian presidential election made a mockery of democracy. His regime has beaten and imprisoned peaceful protesters, as well as journalists, including Ihar Losik and, and Andrei Kuzensky from the Radio Free Europe. As we speak, Lukashenko holds nearly 1,500 political prisoners behind bars. Lukashenko also undermines Belarusian uh, sovereignty by furthering the, the so-called Union State with Russia. He's making Belarus a permanent junior partner to the Kremlin. Belarusian culture is also under attack by the regime and its enablers. Use of the Belarusian language is gradually being replaced by Russian. National symbols, such as the red and white flag, independent Belarus are banned. Vladimir Putin already considers Belarus and its people to be part of Russia. In a speech last month, Putin referred to Belarus, as well as Ukraine, as part of a historic Russian nation. This revisionism is legitimized by allowing Russia to use Belarusian territory to wage its unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine. The U.S. must continue to support the democratic development of Belarus. I applaud the bravery of leaders like, like Ms. Tikhanovskaya for their efforts to fight tyranny, even from exile. From exile. Belarus has served as a launch pad for Russia's full-scale invasion, provided Russia with ammunition, and hosted Russian nuclear weapons. In addition to these measures, the Lukashenko regime's weaponization of refugees by illegally funneling them en masse to the borders of Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, as well as the support for the Wagner Group and increasing integration with Kremlin, also presents a threat to NATO. Most egregiously, Lukashenko has made Belarus an active participant in crimes against abducted Ukrainian children, holding thousands of them in facilities in Belarus for so-called re-education. The international community must hold all levels of Lukashenko's regime accountable for these crimes, alongside his sponsor, Vladimir Putin. I applaud U.S. engagement with the democratic forces of Belarus, as well as the sanctions imposed on Lukashenko, his regime, and enablers in response to the domestic crackdowns and support of Russia's war in Ukraine. However, more can be done. Since June 2022, we have not had a special envoy to Belarus. The Biden administration needs to fix this immediately. The U.S. and our allies must also strengthen our sanctions to make the cost of continued subjugation of the Belarusian people to Lukashenko's repression and Vladimir Putin's imperial ambitions too high. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today how U.S. assistance can better be directed and whether we can, what we can do to increase the pressure on, on Lukashenko and his master, Vladimir Putin. The chair now recognizes ranking member the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating, for any statements that he may have. Uh, thank you, Chairman Keene, for holding uh, this important hearing today on the future and freedom and democracy of Belarus. The presidential elections in August 2020 in Belarus marked a new chapter in the country's history. Prior to the elections, a group of strong, determined, mostly women, leaders led hundreds of thousands of protesters in the streets of Minsk and other cities in Belarus demanding a better future. Those in the streets were not only protesting the brutal and authoritarian crackdown of Alexander Lukashenko, who's ruled Belarus through multiple fraudulent elections, but they were advocating for the protection of their civil and human rights, freedom of speech and assembly, and the maintenance of the rule of law, tenets of any democracy. 
In response to the unprecedented scale and scope of these protests against the rule, uh, Lukashenko forcefully arrested, beat, detained hundreds, if not thousands, of peaceful protesters. He arrested not just the political opposition, but journalists and other people simply chanting for freedom or wearing red and white, the colors of the opposition. Over the last three years since the protests took place, Lukashenko's crackdown has only intensified, and he is in, and his security services have stifled all dissent inside Belarus. Today, over 1,400 political prisoners remain in Belarus, including the leaders uh, like uh, the husband of our witness, Sergei uh, Sikonovsky, Maria uh, Kalesnikova, and others like journalist Ihar Losik. All people we remember along with the others uh, who are being held here, uh, held today as we conduct this hearing. Lukashenko has also extended his repression to Belarusians living outside the country. In 2022, Lukashenko amended the criminal code to allow for trial and abstentia against citizens abroad. And in January 23, uh, a law was passed to enable authorities to revoke citizenship for Belarusians living abroad. At the same time, Lukashenko has been woefully complicit in Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, assisting authorities in the trafficking of Ukrainian children and allowing Russian forces to use Belarusian territory as a staging ground for its illegal invasion. In response to Lukashenko's crackdown at home and support for Russia's war, the United States, in concert with our European allies, has acted forcefully to impose costs on the regime. As uh, of December 1st of this year, the U.S. has imposed sanctions on 111 individuals and 81 entities engaged in human rights abuses, electoral fraud, and corruption, including major financial, uh, petrochemical, potash, manufacturing, state-owned companies who benefit from the re regime's repression, an extensive amount of sanctions. An additional 500 Belarusian officials have been banned from entering the United States or had their U.S. visas suspended or revoked. Congress has also acted, passing my resolution in the 117th Congress, H.R. 124, supporting the people of Belarus and the democratic aspirations of that country. This Congress and I and other uh, co-chairs in the House Belarusian Caucus have introduced H.R.S. 441, which in addition calls for the release of all political prisoners in Belarus. Congress has also appropriated $30 million in supporting civil society and democratic opposition in Belarus. Money. I believe strongly must be included in any upcoming appropriations package. We welcome to this committee uh, the, the leader of the Belarusian opposition, Svetlana Sinkinovskaya, to shine a spotlight on the progress the Belarusian opposition has made towards our democratic future. Uh, for example, the democratic opposition has established a united transitional cabinet and a coordination council, two bodies dedicated to understanding the needs of Belarusians inside and outside the country and advocating for effective policy to meet these needs. Such legislative and executive bodies are vital to the future of democracy in Belarus. Ultimately, united and committed opposition with a deep knowledge of the foundation of a democratic system will only serve to benefit the people of Belarus. At the same time, today's hearing comes just as the inaugural U.S.-Belarus strategic dialogue with the Democratic opposition occurs. This dialogue, which will focus on support for the opposition and furthering accountability measures for the regime, is a significant step in demonstrating the United States' long-term support for the Democratic opposition. I'm hopeful that additional accountability measures from Lukashenko's regime will be announced in the coming days. Three years into this movement, I remain optimistic that the, despite the repression in Belarus, hope remains amongst those in exile, the diaspora, and those inside the country with a brighter, more democratic future. Uh, that hope is why we're here for this committee hearing today, and we hope that across the world, support for Belarus continues to amplify uh, those strong voices, those opposition voices led by our witness here today. Uh, today's hearing is another step towards these goals. With that, I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Smith for five minutes of opening remarks. <clears throat> thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Chairman Kane and Bill Keating. Uh, thank you, the ranking member. Tom, I want to thank you for calling this very important and timely hearing uh, for your leadership and that as well as the ranking member. 
Uh, it, is, it is deeply appreciated by, I know, by the Belarusians, but by every one of us who follow this closely. Thank you so much. Uh, this hearing, of course, is on the future of freedom and democracy in Belarus. Uh, and it is an honor and a high honor and a distinct pleasure to hear from Svetlana Sekhanovskaya, uh, the leader of the free Belarusians everywhere. She has earned this position by showing enormous courage in principle. And many of us, and I believe it beyond any reasonable doubt, she won the election. Uh, it was stolen by Lukashenko. So we are talking to the government, should be the government leader uh, of Belarus. So thank you for not only being on the ballot, but being such a, a tenacious campaigner. Uh, and of course, we, we remember and we pray for not only you, but your husband and the other political prisoners, but your husband, Sergei, uh, for the terrible harshness that he has faced uh, in this long, uh, terrible prison sentence meted out by, by Lukashenko. Uh, your patriotic sacrifice that you were making for your country, uh, you will remember it forever by the Belarusians and by all who believe in human rights and democracy. Uh, you represent millions of Belarusians who suffer under an ever worsening uh, terror campaign by Lukashenko. We know what he has done in partnering with Putin uh, to invade um, Ukraine and all of the terrible enabling that he has done. Uh, you know, when they lied so in a bold-faced way uh, that they were just doing maneuvers and having war games, all the while preparing for uh, a terrible, unprovoked invasion. Lukashenko, I believe, is guilty of war crimes, uh, and he needs to be held to account uh, by the ICC and any other uh, uh, court uh, that will take this up. He ought to be, co along with Putin, uh, named uh, for any kind of indictment for what he has done. Um, I met with Lukashenko in 2017. As I think you know, in 2004, I was the author of the Belarus Democracy Act and did the uh, updates and, and expansions in 06, 2012, and then working with my good friend and colleague Bill Keating, uh, we expanded it in 2020. Uh, and Lukashenko, at a meeting, I was barred from going there until the OSCE had a parliamentary assembly in Lithuania, and 11 of us traveled over to meet with him and to argue with him. And he called me public enemy number one. Uh, and uh, you know, big deal, I leave the country. <laughs> you and all of your fellow Belarusians go to jail, not you, but your husband, uh, for being such stalwart believers in freedom, democracy, the rule of law, and fundamental human rights. Uh, I am circulating to the other members, uh, the Belarus Democracy Act and Human Rights uh, and Sovereignty Act of 2023, uh, which we hope to move as quickly as we can. Uh, he won't like that either. Tough. Uh, we, we need to pass it. We need to pass it quickly. Uh, and it will provide a number of things, including temporary protective status for Belarusians who are here. Again, the special envoy to coordinate efforts in support of freedom-loving Belarusians and updates U.S. sanctions and reporting to Congress on Lukashenko's support for the war and Ukraine, as well as his despicable behavior. Uh, so that we'll be working on that. And, uh, uh, but again, I can't thank you enough. All of us feel this way. Uh, I chair the Human Rights Committee uh, of this uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, and we watch everything that's going on in Belarus, uh, and it is, it is awful. And, and you are such a, a noble and, and patriotic leader, and for which we all have such deep respect. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Smith, and thank you for your extraordinary leadership on this issue over such a long period of time. Um, and thank you to have you for joining us here today as well. Other members of the subcommittee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We're pleased to have a distinguished witness before us today on this important topic. Uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya is a national leader of Belarus and head of the United Transitional Cabinet. Thank you for being here today. Your full statement will be made part of the record, and I ask that you keep your verbal remarks to five minutes in order to allow time for member questions. I now recognize uh, Ms. Tikhanovskaya for her opening statement. Dear Chairman, Dear Chairman Kane Rankin, uh, Member Keating, Honorable Members of Subcommittee. Let me express gratitude to the U.S. Congress and the American people for many years of the support of the democratic aspirations of the Belarusian people. 
I am confident that Belarus will become a truly independent, free country, a reliable partner, and a member of the European Union and transatlantic community. But to achieve this goal, we must dismantle the illegitimate regime of dictator Lukashenko, who, with Russia's help and under its control, has usurped power. In 2020, Belarusians made a clear choice in favor of democracy, freedom, and human rights. However, the dictator refused to step down and drowned the nation in terror. 60,000 were detained. Hundreds of thousands had to flee. Thousands of political prisoners were taken hostages, including Nobel Peace Prize laureate Alex Bilyatsky, my colleague Maria Kolesnikova, presidential hopeful Viktor Babarika, activist Polina Sharenda Panasyuk, journalist Igor Losik, and my husband Sergei Tikhanovsky, sentenced to 19 years. My children didn't see their daddy for three and a half years, and since March this year, I have not heard anything from him, and I don't know if he is alive. People in prisons are tortured and kept incommunicado. More than 100 people are in critical condition and might not survive. The release of political prisoners is a matter of urgency. Lukashenko's regime became a threat to the entire Europe. It hijacked the Ryanair flight to kidnap a dissident journalist. It continues sending illegal migrants to the border with Lithuania, Poland, and Latvia. It dragged our country into Russia's aggression against Ukraine and continues to support the war with weapons, infrastructure, and training, airspace, and land. Dictator participated in the abduction of Ukrainian children from the occupied territories. For Putin's support, Lukashenko pays with our sovereignty. Russia is taking control of the Belarusian economy, national security, foreign affairs, and media. There is an ongoing Russian attack on Belarusian culture, language, and national identity. Russia expands its military presence in Belarus. Recently, it deployed nuclear weapons on our land. We support Ukraine's just war for its survival because the fates of our countries are intertwined. We fight against the same evil and for the same values. Without free Belarus, there will be no free Ukraine, and vice versa. We understand that changes in Belarus are, is our responsibility, but we can't do it alone. We need U.S. support. We applaud the U.S. State Department unprecedented decision to launch strategic dialogue with Belarusian democratic forces. We call on the U.S. to support our efforts to preserve independence and restore democracy in our nation. The appointment of the U.S. Special Envoy should help build a coalition for independent democratic Belarus. We ask to recognize agreements signed by the dictator with uh, Russia as void and impose new sanctions against Russia for its illegal attempts to subjugate Belarus. Belarus shouldn't become a consolation prize to Russia. Free Belarus will be the strongest sanction against Putin and will help Ukraine win this war. Therefore, supporting free Belarus is not charity. It's your investment into the global peace and security. We call on you to provide material assistance to Belarusians fighting for freedom and democracy, to independent media and families of the repressed. Support those who live in exile and can't return home. I call on the U.S. Congress to support the temporary protected status for Belarusian national, nationals in the U.S. Belarusians abroad are denied renewing their passports. In response, we prepare to issue a new Belarusian national passport and we ask the Congress to endorse this project. We should increase pressure on the regime. Sanctions are not a silver bullet, but it is a way to weaken the regime, release people from prisons, and stop its involvement in the war. And we must end impunity. Let's bring Lukashenko and his cronies to account through international courts. The regime has a long record of crimes, including crimes against humanity, torture, killings, and abduction of Ukrainian children. All dictatorships fall, and Lukashenko's dictatorship will fall too. 
when you discuss an economic recovery plan for Ukraine and Moldova, please include Belarus as well. And finally, I call on the U.S. Congress to support the newest edition of the Belarus Democracy, Sovereignty and Human Rights Act. It will show U.S. leadership and, and commitment to the values we all stand for. So, dear friends, uh, the path to freedom and democracy may be long and difficult, but you know, this path is the only right one, and so let's walk this path together. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Zizinovskaya. I now recognize myself for five minutes. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, the U.S. has not had a special envoy for Belarus since January 2022. This is unacceptable. Can you please describe how the appointment of a new special envoy would improve U.S. policy in dealing with Lukashenko and supporting the democratic forces? I remember how the first special envoy was designated. It was Julia Fischer. She opened so much doors for us, the democratic uh, movement in uh, the USA Congress and State Department and the White House. And special envoy is a bridge between our democratic forces and the USA, uh, uh, all the branches. So it will help us to explain uh, situation in Belarus. It will help us to persuade the uh, government of the USA to um, to study the opportunity, you know, to work out on the strategy on new Belarus. Because now we see there is uh, no strategy towards Belarus about this future. Uh, of course, we appreciate all the help and assistance and uh, uh, pressure on the regime and assistance to Belarusian people, but we need clearly understand what will be the, f the future steps of, uh, uh, of the U.S. And uh, that's why we need this person, uh, first of all, to, uh, uh, you know, to be our, the best friend here uh, in the U.S. and be best friends to Belarus and part, to be this, as I said, bridge. So, it, of course, it's uh, you know, very important for, uh, for us, and uh, I hope that uh, new special envoy hopefully it will be designated very soon. Uh, we'll uh, also unite all the special envoys that have been um, designated by European countries. It's already an alliance of countries who designate special envoys who don't work with the pro-regime uh, Belarus, but with democratic forces. The new Washington this week for so-called comprehensive strategic dialogue with the State Department. What results do you hope to achieve through the democratic forces meetings this week with the strategic dialogue? Uh, of course, we uh, would like to have final uh, joint communique statement with the main political messages uh, in the support of democratic, sovereign and independent Belarus. Acknowledgement of the United Transitional Cabinet uh, and Coordination Council work and welcoming elections to Coordination Council. Uh, also, uh, post-war security architecture and Belarus' uh, essential role in it. And recognizing the need uh, for the con concerted pushback to Russia's illegal actions against Belarus. Uh, Non-recognition of Lukashenko's agreement uh, with Russia after 2020. Welcoming the goal of Belarus to join uh, European Union and transatlantic community. Commitment to support democratic movement continued pressure on the regime, including sanctions and supporting accountability efforts. Okay. You, you have gone on record stating that loopholes are weakening the sanctions imposed on Lukashenko and his regime. I would like to see more effective sanctions in place so we can hold this dictatorship accountable for its crimes. Can you please describe um, the loopholes that currently exist and how can the U.S., the U.K., and the E.U. improve our sanctions for maximum impact? No, the sanctions that exist now, sanctions against Lukashenko's regime, uh, cannot be effective because of uh, the loopholes. Uh, 
uh, that can be easily circumvented by uh, Lukashenko's regime. And Lukash Lukashenko and uses Russia and Russia uses Lukashenko's regime to circumvent the sanctions. Uh, uh, regime of Belarus opens Dota enterprises in Russia and continue to trade with the European Union. You know, trade with the European Union increased several times since the beginning of the war. You know, and they buy uh, goods from uh, Europe to Russia and sell uh, um, uh, Belarusian goods as uh, goods from uh, other countries. For example, they put a label of Kyrgyzstan, for example, on the Belarusian goods and sell it as Kyrgyzstan. But, uh, you know, it's evident that, uh, you know, it's circumventing of uh, sanctions. So um, we need, first of all, uh, Joint, have to have joint position on uh, closing the loopholes and it should be efforts uh, of the USA together with European Union, Canada and the UK. And uh, also please consider individual sanctions. We, you have already mentioned uh, this, that judges, prosecutors, uh, all those people who committed crimes against Belarusian people uh, have to be put on sanction, uh, on sanction list. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I now recognize Ranking Member Keating for any questions he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank you for being here uh, and for everything you're doing. Uh, I'd just like to uh, make sure there's a strong bipartisan uh, support here uh, for the appointment of a Special Envoy. Uh, we saw the work of former Ambassador Julie Fisher, who was terrific. Yeah. Uh, we all really admired her work while she was the uh, Ambassador. Uh, we admire the work of Peter Kaufman, that he, it continues going forward, but I think having this role uh, filled uh, would give more uh, strength to internationally to that position, so it's something we strongly endorse. Uh, I've known you now for a, a few years, and uh, I just admire your courage uh, beyond words. Um, sacrifice to your family, uh, everything you've done. Um, you said in your opening statement uh, that you haven't, you don't know whether your husband is even alive, mm -hmm. uh, and you haven't had, haven't had contact for that period of time. Uh, at a time when democracy is being threatened, not just in Belarus, uh, but around the world, uh, including in the United States, uh, this is a critical time that we look to leaders like yourself. Uh, largely, the huge support you had from so many women in the country uh, can be echoed around the world. Uh, but can you share with us, uh, given all that sacrifice, why democracy to you is so important, uh, not just in Belarus, but all, all over the world? Uh, you know, your uh, Representative Kittens, uh, I think that you start to value democracy when you are deprived of it. And people who live in democracy enjoy it every day, forget, you know, how democracy is valuable and that we are fighting for actually the rights and values that you, uh, you, you have in your everyday life. Um, you know, for me, democracy is about responsibility, responsibility of every person to participate in the life of uh, your country, not just to live with your personal cozy lives, but to feel uh, responsibility for, great, for bigger issues. And uh, now, uh, of course, you know, for me, uh, responsibility or for me, democracy is about right of people to express their opinions. And uh, so, we, so as we are lack of it, hundreds of uh, people are in prisons at the moment. Uh, you know, it's a uh, couple of days ago in uh, Belarus, about 200 searches happened. You know that we have coordination council as proto parliament. We are building democratic institutions in exile at the moment, but but we want to show and to study how democracy works. And people who are members of coordination council, uh, they are sacrificing uh, freedom of their relatives. You know, their relatives in Belarus have been detained. Their uh, flats, apartments were ruined just because of these people are parts of democratic institution we are trying to build. And people like uh, you know ready to do this because we, we know how it's important to study democracy and to build democracy in Belarus. Many people are sacrificing in Belarus in in, the, in exile. Uh, so uh, it's a big price. It's a big um, price. You know we are paying uh, at the moment. So uh, again, we can't do it alone. 
You know, I, I really cherish democracy of uh, the USA, and I'm absolutely sure that you feel this moral obligation you know, to help those who are, uh, want to gain the same uh, rights that you have. Well, thank you. Um, you know, coming from you in particular, uh, given what you've gone through and continue to go through, uh, that democracy is just not a privilege to be taken for granted, but a responsibility and a shared one. Yep. Uh, and very briefly uh, along those lines, uh, there's some debate here in the U.S. now about funding Ukraine. Uh, how important is that to Belarus, but also to democracy in general? No, I urge all the countries, and of course, uh, powerful and significant USA, to help Ukraine with all the possible means. Because Ukrainians now are fighting not only for their lands, but they're fighting against dictatorship. We must remember that dictatorship is like cancer. You know, until it casts to the last cell, it will spread further and further. So we, like, democratic countries help, have to help those who are on the front line of this fight. Believe us, if, I, I'm absolutely sure that Ukraine, Ukraine will win this war, but if uh, they lose, it will be disaster, not only for our region, not only for Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, and so on and so forth, but also for all uh, democratic countries. De democracy has to show its teeth because uh, dictators are learning very fast from each other. You know, they use the same tools. And we have to, sh to, to show that democracy also has tools to counter uh, dictatorship. Because they are crossing, uh, dictators are crossing red line after red line. And if they see that democracy can't answer, you know, they go further and further. They become bolder. So uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, I understand that uh, under the, uh, the victory of Ukraine influenced a lot uh, situation in Belarus too. Because we are, both countries are facing the same enemy imperialistic ambitions of Russia. And without free Ukraine, there will be no free Belarus. And, but also vice versa, we have to remember that without free independent Belarus, there will be constant threat to security of the whole region uh, of Europe. So help Ukraine to win this war. I really uh, believe that uh, assistance, any possible assistance to Ukraine will not stop. Thank you and for your cautionary words uh, about the spread uh, of this when it's not uh, extinguished in the first place, particularly as we look to China, Iran, North Korea, and other areas. So I yield back and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keating. I now recognize uh, Congressman Heisinger from Michigan for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I, I get into my uh, questions and statements, I, I do think it's important that the record reflect and clarify what, uh, what uh, Chairman Smith was saying about him being declared as public enemy number one. That is not unique. There's many despots and dictators around the world who have declared you public enemy number one. Why? Because of your work on making sure these types of voices are heard. And I want to say thank you uh, to the chairman uh, for this um, and for this hearing and for bringing light to this. Interestingly enough, I have a son who's studying uh, in Spain right now, and he's on a break and they're in Prague right now. Um, I happened to be in Prague in January of 1989. Um, <laughs> I was caught up in pro-democracy, uh, what turned into a riot, and was chased by riot police, and nearly clubbed, and had dogs and water cannons uh, chase me and my, and my college uh, friends as we were there. And my son, now, uh, who was there, was visiting the Museum of Communism t earlier today. And he was, we've been texting. I wish I could share some of the texts in our conversation, but uh, it just, it struck me. You know, as my, as my trip, we went to Moscow and Leningrad, St. Petersburg, Warsaw, uh, Prague, uh, East Berlin at the time, Prague and Budapest. Um, and my son in this generation doesn't know what had happened in the Cold War. And they also don't know necessarily the connectivity between what we are seeing now today with these people who are, are desperate to hold on to power and will do anything, anything to stamp out the voices of freedom and liberty. 
So I want to say thank you for what you are doing and for those folks that are remaining behind fighting back against this. I was able to leave Prague. I was able to come back home to the United States. Um, many cannot. They cannot flee that. And uh, that, that, those are lessons that we cannot forget. Um, and so again, I just want to commend you for what you are doing in leading that uh, and being a voice for freedom and liberty for the people of Belarus. Um, one of those things that uh, we've seen as a as sort of a marker of, of, of uh, despotism and dictators is crackdowns on various groups, oftentimes on religious groups. And we're seeing this in Belarus right now. Is that not, is that not true? We're seeing the, the, the churches being uh, cracked down on. I'd love for you to comment a little bit on that. Um, there, uh, there's reports that Belarus has detained, fined, imprisoned, and uh, pushed out of their positions or forced into exile at least 60 religious leaders of the Belarusian, uh, Belarusian Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Greek Catholic, and various Protestant churches since the 2020 crackdown. Um, would you describe what's happening as also part of a, a crackdown on religious freedom in Belarus? You know, in uh, 2020, people of uh, different layers of population of different professions were on the streets uh, uh, opposing fraudulent elections in Belarus. And among those, of course, there were a lot of people of religion. Of, uh, uh, of different confessions. And uh, of course, the uh, regime started to uh, put revenge uh, on uh, religion, religious institutions in our, in our country. The problem is that uh, all the um, uh, Orthodox uh, churches in Belarus belong to the state and they can easily you know, uh, close uh, churches just and it's the way to blackmail religious people. Uh, many uh, priests are in jails, in Belarusian jails at the moment and recognized as political prisoners. Uh, many of them had to flee uh, Belarus because of repressions and now they serve in uh, Lithuanian and Polish churches. They continue to do this. But of course, Belarusian church is also under repressions. They are uh, made to keep silence. They are forbidden to pray for those uh, who are in prisons, for families of political prisoners. They are uh, forbidden to pray for future free Belarus without wars. So uh, they're also under pressure, but I'm absolutely sure that uh, when the window of opportunity comes to Belarus again, all those people will be in this pro-democratic moment. And if you come, well, let's say when you come into power, uh, and, and Lukashenko is no longer there. Uh, would you support religious freedom and the ability for these people to gather and worship as they, as they see fit? Absolutely. We, I fully welcome religious freedom in Belarus and uh, all the confessions should be presented in our country without any pressure. And uh, we, um, you know, among Belarusian uh, society, there is absolute tolerance to people of uh, all religious and there will be full consensus among Belarusian people that uh, people for religions have to be presented in our country. Uh, my, my time is expiring. I, I wish I had uh, gone shorter on my story of my experiences that pale with anything that you, uh, that you have been going through. Um, I wanted to explore a little more of how sort of uh, hybrid or irregular uses of, of, uh, of um, things like downing or grounding of an international airliner to get to, uh, to an opposition journalist or how uh, migrants and, and refugees are being used really as, as weapons against surrounding countries. And, and uh, I'll leave it up to the chairman if he want, is able to give you some time to comment on that. Um, but uh, I just want to say, uh, uh, Ms. Sikhanovskaya, uh, uh, right? As, uh, sorry, with a name like Heisinga, it's uh, also difficult. Uh, I just want to again say thank you uh, for your efforts, uh, your bravery, uh, your courage, and your voice uh, that is here. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, we that not, inquiry, yeah, please, thank you, thank you. Now we are talking about uh, crimes of Lukashenko's regime. Uh, 
You know, he committed crimes against person people. First of all, we have to consider this. Uh, people are being tortured, people are being humiliated constantly in, uh, in uh, prisons. Uh, people in Belarus are um, kept in this atmosphere of tyranny on the daily basis. But also regime started to um, uh, put revenge on uh, our neighboring countries. And this migration crisis that was orchestrated by the regime, it's revenge on uh, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia for constant support of Belarusian democratic forces. And uh, uh, it will not stop, you know, until we stop uh, dictator, you know, all these efforts to blackmail, to put pressure on our neighbors will continue. So we have to uh, not to treat symptoms of this disease that is dictatorship, but to uh, treat the main problem. And uh, uh, let's return to hijacking of the airplane. You know, this was act of uh, terrorism from the side of uh, the regime, and uh, uh, this uh, case was investigated, but still no punishment came for, for this crime. And uh, I think we should use all the possible international uh, justice mechanism like ICC, ICJ, universal jurisdiction to bring uh, Lukashenko and all those responsible to account. Please help us to endorse uh, this uh, special investigation appeal to uh, Karim Khan for him to pay attention to the issue of uh, Belarusian regime crimes. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Heisinger, for, for bringing that important issues up. Uh, the chair uh, now recognizes uh, Mr. Amo from Rhode Island for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I really appreciate your welcome uh, and warm welcome to this uh, committee and uh, to the ranking member as well. Uh, and I'm pleased uh, to join my first hearing uh, hosted by the subcommittee uh, on Europe. And I, I really just want to thank our, our witness uh, for uh, your remarkable strength, uh, your perseverance under uh, what I, I can't imagine uh, to be the most uh, intense of pressure, both uh, in your own family unit, but also the, the family uh, of, of Belarus collectively that uh, requires uh, a real change. And I am so honored to be before you uh, as you lead. Uh, it is important that I am here today in this first hearing because it's a topic that means so much to me, democracy, uh, democracy and the preservation of it. And so, you know, it is clear uh, that there is uh, bipartisan uh, support uh, uh, domestically for uh, our, our, our commitment to, to democracy. And I appreciate those in Belarus uh, who are demonstrating their strong desire and commitment to a democratic future. I especially want to recognize uh, that women have played a leading role uh, in Belarusian, uh, uh, the democratic uh, movement uh, that, that has grown. And I am uh, so glad uh, to, to be adding my voice uh, in my early weeks here in Congress. And I'm proud that Congress, uh, that the last Congress passed several uh, measures pa uh, to affirm the support for the aspirations uh, of the people of Belarus for democracy, for human rights, for the rule of law. Uh, the fulfillment of these aspirations uh, is critical to ensuring the continued uh, strength of Belarusian sovereignty and territorial integrity. I hope to build on that support in this Congress. And I'm also encouraged uh, by those across the Biden uh, administration uh, who are supporting the democratic movement and holding accountable its anti-democratic leaders. Uh, the strategic dialogue uh, provides a, a great opportunity and that uh, is, is one of the things that I wanted to uh, ask uh, about today. You know, I wanted to get a sense from you the, about the role of the Belarusian private sector uh, in, in the dialogue and, and what uh, what role do you think uh, they have in uh, accelerating uh, the, our, our pathway uh, to change uh, and, and making sure that uh, the, the democratic opposition uh, is, is able to, to ultimately lead? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I have to say, first of all, that uh, uh, since 2020, many uh, Belarusian small businesses and entrepreneurs also were under repressions and had to flee Belarus. And now uh, many businessmen are trying to um, 
reopen their businesses abroad uh, just to uh, work uh, for uh, you know for democratic forces you know to help uh, uh, democratic institutions and families of repressed and to uh, contribute into cultural projects of uh, of uh, belarus uh, and of course we want to work with the us to help private businesses uh, in belarus uh, to grow and uh, it uh, includes uh, getting advice from the U.S. experts and making plans uh, based on what works well in the in the, in, in the U.S. You know, Belarusians want to see the future after Lukashenko. You know, we want Belarusian people, Belarusian business to blossom at the moment, maybe in exile because it's difficult to uh, stay loyal in uh, to uh, loyal to democratic aspirations and work in uh, in Lukashenko's Belarus now but we want to develop um, the private sector in exile at the moment and we ask you to help those people you know to provide them with new uh, connections with the businesses who maybe would like in future after Belarus becomes democratic to invest into our country we have wonderful hard working people we have wonderful ge geographic uh, position but we have uh, poor management in our country if give our people opportunity to work freely and to make this the businesses freely uh, they could contribute so much in our in uh, our economy but we have to start to work now about for future of uh, belarus so we ask for your assistance assistance in this direction as well well i appreciate that that uh, dignity of participating in in the in the private sector and driving that uh, innovation and, and growth is something that uh, I, I hope is a value that we can help blossom. And with that, uh, I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Congressman Amo. I now recognize the vice chair of this uh, committee, Congressman Self from Texas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you say in your testimony that the uh, Belarusian people do not want to be a Russian surrogate or Russified. Um, I'm trying to gauge, because the United States doesn't have a very good record over the last 20 years working in different cultures, understanding different cultures. So I'm trying to gauge the, uh, the support across the nine plus million people of Belarus. So what are the activities that you see inside your country? Are there underground resistance movements? Are there is there, are there any active resistance movements? Talk to me about the nine million people, not just the, the few in the democracy movement. What is the mood of your people? I'm absolutely sure that most of the Russian people uh, are dreaming about democratic and uh, free country. But people who are under repressions, you know, who are under threat of uh, uh, being um, being prosecuted you know every day can't be vocal just imagine for speaking against regime you can get 15 20 years in jail for supporting ukraine you can get 10 15 years in jail for donating 20 euros to ukrainian army you get six years in jail this is our reality and of course we want to save people uh, because there will be a new wind of opportunity for us and we want people to be uh, safe and secure uh, for this moment. Of course, people are not just sitting and waiting when this wind of opportunity comes. People are working uh, and working underground, of course. People have to, um, uh, to hide, okay. you know, their Thank aspirations. You. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, believe you me, we understand uh, that. Uh, the real target of the January 6th is the American people so that you don't go to the street corner and make your uh, views known. I want to talk about the, uh, the enforcing the sanctions. What do you, how do you recommend the U.S. admin uh, enforce the sanctions better? Because um, we are looking in Congress, we are looking for ways because uh, this administration has allowed Iran, for instance, to sell at least $60 billion uh, in oil. So how do we change the behavior of this administration to help you enforce the sanctions on Russia? So, uh, 
you know there are still uh, still fields of Belarusian economy that can be under sanctions it's uh, woods it's steel uh, that is not that are not under sanctions at the moment and as I have said before you know we have to close loopholes because trade with the uh, uh, our neighbors with the, uh, other foreign countries is still continuing despite of sanctions. We have to understand that sanctions on Russia are mostly imposed on uh, import in Belarus on export. And Russia, uh, Russian regime and Belarusian regime are using each other to circumvent these sanctions. Uh, uh, Lukashenko's regime is selling Russian goods as if they are Belarusian because they're not under sanctions. And uh, so, so what would we do about that? I, I'm loop. trying to understand how we change behavior because that's our that's our own problem in the U.S. How do we change behavior? Uh, it's not about behavior. It's about uh, instruments that allow to uh, detain all those uh, businesses, enterprises abroad that tr that helps regimes to avoid to circumvent sanctions. You know, you I don't know. You have to uh, launch uh, um, special. Um, uh, mechanism of sanction uh, circumvention that will follow fulfillment of the sanctions. Okay. I know that in the USA you have secondary sanctions. Can you urge European Union, for example, to uh, create the same mechanism? Got it. We're trying to do that in relationship to Iran as well. So you're in Washington for the strategic dialogue with the State Department. So what do you expect to come out of that <clears throat> strategic dialogue? So uh, I have already listed, you know, what we are waiting for from this, but uh, we need uh, U.S. strategy for Belarus. We need to understand how the U.S. is percepting situation in our country that you will not allow, you will help us not uh, allow uh, Belarus to be left as consolation prize. That, that's a great point. Let me interrupt yes. you. I'm almost out of, town to say, uh, out of time to say we can't get a strategy for Ukraine out of the administration. I, I hope you have success with the administration. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Self. I now uh, yield five minutes to Chairman Smith from New Jersey. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for the courtesy of allowing me to sit on your, your committee. <clears throat> um, Ms. Sukhanovskaya, let me just... Uh, one of my concerns is that the Putin-Lukashenko uh, horrific war in Ukraine uh, has diminished, however unwittingly, uh, the focus on the U in the U.S. and the West uh, on, the, on human rights in Ukraine being committed against, in Belarus being committed against people like your husband. We know that there's a lot of political prisoners who are arrested, then let out, so there's this reign of terror. A lot of the long stayers, like your husband, 19 years, continue unfortunately, to, to be uh, incarcerated. Um, my hope is with the Belarus Democracy Act of 2023 that we will begin a pivot towards remembering because it has become, unfortunately, and, um, you know, war does crowd out other concerns, but it shouldn't, uh, so we can get back to, and you mentioned the strategy, which I think is so extremely important. So uh, the sooner we get that legislation passed and into law, mm -hmm. uh, the better. And I can assure you we will work overtime to make sure that that happens. And I thank the chairman uh, for co-sponsoring and, and, again, for holding this important pivot hearing with you, which is so extremely important, and the ranking member, of course. Um, you know, twice this year, Lukashenko was met with Xi Jinping. He met with Xi Jinping again on Monday. Uh, they're talking Belt and Road, which would be a, a, an opportunity to get a great deal of funding from uh, the communist dictatorship of Xi Jinping. Um, and I'm very concerned, and I'm interested in hearing what you have to say on this. You know, Xi Jinping has perfected a lot of human rights modalities, including torture, which obviously Lukashenko knows a great deal about. But he also has excelled in co-opting and destroying the churches and the, uh, the Uyghurs. And, you know, he's committing genocide, as we all know, in Xinjiang. Uh, but he's also developed a surveillance capability that is second to none, often with the aid and support of American corporations like Fisher and others, uh, which is outrageous. I'm wondering if you're concerned, uh, or perhaps are looking at, and maybe part of the strategy you share with uh, or, or get out of the U.S. Department of State, is how uh, Xi Jinping might be looking to convey that surveillance, which is ubiquitous uh, throughout China, to Belarus, making it even harder uh, for dissidents 
democracy activists, and church people uh, to speak out. Because everywhere you look, there is surveillance uh, in China. And, and it's, it's become, um, like I said, it is everywhere. So if you could speak to that. Also, the churches, um, what can we do to raise the issue of the churches um, uh, and the people of faith, the pastors, the clergymen that are being incarcerated? Are there co-religionists speaking out? Is the Pope said enough? For example, on the Catholic side, uh, as other Orthodox said, enough. It seems, again, um, you, we get so distracted by what's happening uh, in the Middle East, and we got to deal with that, of course. China, Taiwan, of course, Ukraine. Um, I just had a hearing on the, on the ongoing brutality uh, of, uh, in, um, in Nicaragua uh, under Ortega, where he's holding priest bishops and many other people, including um, the, a bishop who got a very long 26-year prison sentence for what? Preaching the gospel. So if you could, on this idea of uh, China's uh, getting involved, also the pivot, which you are helping all of us uh, to make sure that we do our part in a pivot back to Belarus democracy. Uh, thank you, Representative Smith, for your questions. First of all, I will respond on uh, uh, what can you do uh, on the religious aspect. You know, uh, we have tried a lot to attract attention of uh, uh, the Pope, you know, to the problem political prisoners, and uh, we want uh, Catholic churches uh, to um, play part in release of uh, our political prisoners. As I said, we have about 100 people who are in extremely poor uh, physical state. Pe people are dying there, people with cancer, diabetes, and uh, we need uh, humanitarian possibility to release at least these people without any conditions. So, and church, of course, can play here a huge, uh, huge role. So if you can appeal uh, to the room, uh, you know, to for urge them to uh, start this negotiation about release of political prisoners without any conditions, we would uh, really, really uh, appreciate it. And as for uh, Lukashenko's visits to China, uh, Kozlo Lukashenko needs support. He has now only ally uh, Putin, and he's trying to act, like attract attention of, of uh, China as well. Uh, but China, uh, you know, they're very pragmatic. They are looking for uh, responsible partners, and knowing that uh, in uh, Belarus there is times of turbulence, they don't want to invest. Uh, in our country, and Lukashenko is visiting like China, I suppose, requesting for money. And uh, so, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, until there will be no normal uh, situation in Belarus, China wouldn't invest in, in uh, Belarus, but Lukashenko needs resources, you know, and uh, that's why we have to push more uh, to isolate uh, Lukashenko more economically, to change his behavior, and to start release, uh, release political prisoners and start negotiations with democratic forces. Just real quick, we will do the letter, um, and we'll do it immediately to the Pope. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Smith. I now yield five minutes to Representative Titus from Nevada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you so much for being here. It's welcome back. It's nice to see you again. And I join the others in just commending your courage and your determination, especially against such great odds and not having seen your husband in such a long time. You are truly a heroic leader of this movement in Belarus. So thank you for doing that. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the cabinet in exile and what your how your government structured and and what you are doing exactly there to keep the movement alive and maybe what we can do in addition to sanctions to help you strengthen that movement? You know, I'm really proud of Belarusian people who uh, during these three years are still managing to keep energy alive, you know, to continue our fight. We really feel responsibility for all those who are in prisons, and we feel responsibility for the future of our country. And of course, we uh, I realize how institutions are important. And we, uh, since the beginning, started to build democratic institutions. Yes, they are in exile at the moment because it's impossible to do something visible inside Belarus. So uh, since 2020, we have built a United Transitional Cabinet mm -hmm. as proto-government. Uh, 
where representatives from different directions uh, are working, and also coordination council as prota parliament. Uh, I want to underline that the families uh, of uh, uh, participants of Coordination Council are uh, under uh, repressions inside Belarus, but people continue to, to be in Coordination Council because they understand how it's important. Uh, hopefully next year uh, there will be new elections in Coordination Council because we want uh, our institutions to work in the most democratic mm -hmm. way. We are actually studying how to live in a democracy and uh, I hope that it will be good alternative to illegitimate so-called Lukashenko's uh, elections in, in uh, local uh, elections in Belarus. Um, you know, Maybe I want to underline once again how material assistance is important for a democratic movement. Uh, to uh, launch cultural initiatives, to strengthen and keep our cultural identity, our language. Uh, to media. Media is crucial, countering Russian and Belarusian propaganda. Let's uh, keep in mind that Russia puts billions of euros or dollars to uh, Belarus to support uh, propagandistic uh, editions and channels in Belarus. And we, like media in exile, have to counter this huge uh, propagandistic machine. We have to be creative, we have to be inventive, but maybe we are lack of enough resources, you know, to doing uh, great things. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we are, uh, there is urgency to support uh, families of political prisoners and political prisoners who already like served the attempts and uh, also had to flee Belarus because repressions even after that you served your attempts continuing mm -hmm. and people are uh, released in awful um, uh, physical and emotional state mm. and these people need rehabilitation and uh, we need uh, support and organizing of this rehabilitation program for people to feel that they are not abandoned you know that uh, they uh, you know like sacrificed their freedom their health but they will have opportunity to to rehabilitate themselves you know after how after. do you get information back into the country to keep the movement alive no, God bless internet, because now it's uh, much more possibilities to communicate with people inside Belarus through different um, um, internet tools. So, for example, I myself every week have uh, um, uh, hours of conversation with Belarusians who from inside can can call me and we can discuss anything all the media have they like local journalists who mm. provide them information all the uh, organizations uh, ngos that have been ruined inside the country but managed to recover their activity in exile have people inside the country i know that uh iri and ndi were pushed out of belarus and had to kind of move their headquarters somewhere else and just kind of do forays into the country this has been several years ago i suspect that's gotten even harder uh of course it's harder but uh, you know people in belarus also not giving up you know people create small communities people are really afraid to do this but they are doing because they know it's, it's necessary people are still continue to communicate you know inside the country why repressions are continuing because regime knows as only they stop repressions there will be again thousands uh, millions of people on the streets so they want to control people through this constant fear uh, and uh, small acts of sabotage still going on in Belarus, acts of disobedience. Uh, our partisan movement is still there. They, st they uh, stopped Russian equipment going to Ukraine at the beginning of the war. In the middle, there were acts of sabotage. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, when uh, our country, our land will be used for uh, attacking Ukraine again, our partisans will be there uh, immediately. So. Society is boiling, you know, but, uh, you know, there is no possibility to be vocal, but we have to save our people alive and uh, free just to, for them to be active when the moment comes. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I'm, I now am going to recognize uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Keating, for a second round of questions for up to five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You mentioned that... Uh, you know, journalists, uh, news people, independent news people, uh, people uh, like 
uh, Ihar Lozik, uh, are imprisoned or silenced one way or the other. And there's reasons dictators do that, because they don't want the free flow of information about what's really going on uh, that affects people's lives there to be known to people. Uh, I wonder, to the extent that uh, the people of Belarus understand uh, how they've been used, uh, how they're in jeopardy uh, as a stage of nuclear weapons for the Russians, uh, how dangerous that is to them, uh, for the military training that's going on, uh, how dangerous that could be for them, given the Ukraine war that's there. Uh, I wonder if they understand uh, in Belarus just how it's being used uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the report from Conflict Observatory uh, showed with their studies that uh, they, de they detailed the 2,400 children uh, that were being kidnapped from Ukrainian families and that uh, there's 13 facilities in Belarus th that are housing them now. Do the people there uh, understand uh, the, the torture that's going on in Ukraine by the Russians, they, how much they understand the sexual assaults and the rapes, and uh, do, they, do they know about uh, Bucha and the mass graves that are there? Uh, do they know about this child kidnapping that's occurred and how this is there? How is, well are the, is the news getting into there so the uh, populace in Belarus can fully understand just the uh, jeopardy they're being placed into uh, themselves as well as the the way their freedoms are being taken away from them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, uh, I see that Belarusian people are looking for honest news. They're not just uh, blindly believe in uh, propaganda TV. You know, they don't want to be brainwashed. So that's why uh, people are watching uh, alternative news from uh, Belarusian free media. Uh, of course, it's also dangerous. I have to remind you that uh, all the alternative media in Belarus have been recognized as extremists. And if a person inside country uh, following alternative news or subscribed on uh, alternative free media, then can be detained for years for this act. But we know that uh, interest in uh, honest news is increasing. And of course, people are watching also Ukrainian news. Of course, people know everything. They can't be vocal about these atrocities. They can't say anything against the war in Ukraine because immediately they will be detained. It's like Stalin's time era now in, in uh, our country. But uh, why I said about support to, to media, because it's so crucial you know, to uh, tell truth about, uh, about the reality, about the deployment of nuclear weapons, how Russia wants to subjugate our country, how Russia wants to anchor their presence for years ahead with deployment of nuclear weapons, how Lukashenko is participating in the war, in abduction of Ukrainian children. Uh, it's our task to deliver all these messages inside the country. Of course, now internet is our main uh, way of, of uh, delivering these messages. YouTube, different uh, social networks like Instagram, even TikTok, I, don't, I know that you don't like it, but uh, nevertheless, we want to appeal to every, every person you know, inside the country. You know, who maybe somebody can be even for Lukashenko, uh, for Russia, against the war. Nevertheless, we want them to know the truth or to watch alternative alternative news and see what what's uh, reality. And uh, what's disturbing me more is that uh, people abroad, ordinary people, don't know uh, the news, uh, what's going on in Belarus in the moment. So that's why we urge. Uh, 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 Radio Free Europe here in the USA to open Belarusian service. We Voice of America, yeah. The Voice of America to open Belarusian service where uh, they will broadcast in Belarusian language, uh, but also on, on uh, uh, English, but about the news of uh, Belarus. For maybe some people of America uh, know where Belarus is situated, that we have border with Ukraine, that uh, you know we have a dictatorship in our country, that we like uh, North Korea uh, at the moment, just to, to learn more uh, about our country. And of course, again, support our media. It's urgent to counter propaganda that, uh, that Russia contributes billions of, of, of uh, uh, euros to, um, uh, to promote their messages and to brainwash people. Those are strong words when you say it's like Stalin's time in your country. Uh, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Keating. And now yield myself for a, 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 up to five minutes for a second round of questions. Um, 
How can the international community hold Lukashenko and his regime accountable for their crimes in, in Ukraine? Should the ICC extend the warrant it issued for the arrest of Vladimir Putin and Maria Lvova Belova for similar crimes to Lukashenko? You know, since the beginning of our revolution, we are trying to bring Lukashenko's regime to, to accountability for his crimes. We try to do this because uh, thousands of people uh, went through tortures in prison. So it's crimes against humanity. Uh, no success at the moment. Uh, hijacking of airplane. It's, uh, it's a threat to, to international security. The investigation was done, but we don't know what's the results. Uh, no punishment for this. Uh, migration crisis, then participation in the war, uh, now uh, abduction of Ukrainian children. And uh, this abduction of Ukrainian children is our chance to bring Lukashenko to accountability because uh, for the same crime, Putin and Lvova Belova was brought to, to accountability and was given a rest warranty. While Lukashenko is not in the same role with them. We have tons of proofs. Uh, of these crimes, uh, tons of evidences that have been delivered to Karim Khan uh, already, uh, and uh, uh, but still no, no special investigation was uh, initiated. The question why? So if you can somehow help us to open this door and to encourage uh, Karim Khan and uh, ICC, you know, to start this investigation, we'll be really grateful because people have to feel that uh, dictators will, shouldn't feel, will not feel impunity for their crimes. That, that's why I brought the, that question up and thank you for answering it in that way. Uh, in 1999, the Belarusian and Russian government signed an agreement creating a so-called union state of Russia and Belarus. Can you please describe how this entity actually subordinates Belarusian sovereignty to Russian control? You know, hardly any person in Belarus will answer what this unity, you know, unity means in reality. Because uh, what they're doing, you know, Lukashenko is putting under the cover of this unity, nobody knows. You know, it's like a strong secret. Uh, what's going on. But of course, uh, Russia can use uh, these uh, signed documents as uh, mm, like, like reason, you know, to continue to subjugate uh, uh, Belarus. We see the process of Russification in our country. We see how Russia is trying to control our education, media, uh, econo uh, economy, military sphere, so maybe under the cover of this union state, you know, and uh, uh, Lukashenko, when he gave our land as launching pad for uh, uh, missiles in attacking Ukraine, he also said that, look, we are with Russia in this union, we have to help uh, uh, this country. But uh, there is no profit for, for, for Belarus as well. It's just ways to uh, deprive our country of independence and sovereignty. And of course, this uh, agreement, this uh, uh, union uh, should be dismantled as soon as Belarus become free uh, and independent. Thank you. Uh, I now uh, yield up to five minutes for a second round of questions to Representative uh, Titus. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, when you first took up this cause after your husband had been imprisoned, uh, Lukashenko said you were just a housewife and you couldn't possibly be president. Well, obviously, you've shown that's not the case. But I would ask you about the role of women in this opposition movement, because we find that women are not only usually the agents of change, but they also bear the heaviest burden with their families, with their husbands going to war. They're left with few resources. Could you talk about that a little bit, and uh, in both in your movement and in Belarus? Uh, you know, our revolution is often called uh, a revolution with women's face. And uh, I now realize that maybe women are more effective on long distance. Now we see that our fight is not a sprint, it is a marathon. And uh, women are really more effective and uh, uh, stable, uh, I would say, uh, in our fight. Uh, uh, maybe uh, because we feel more 
a responsibility for the future of our country because it's the future of our children as well. We are preparing this country for better life of our uh, children and uh, grandchildren. And of course, uh, in future Belarus, there will be no even discussion about uh, gender uh, inequality because our women proved that they can be leaders. Uh, many um, uh, women are the leaders of the most uh, initiatives, political, cultural, uh, media initiatives in our country. So we have proved that we are much stronger than we might seem uh, sometimes. And uh, let's see how many brave women are behind the bars at the moment. Let's recall how Maria Kolesnikova took her passport to stay in the country. Polina Sharenda Panasiuk, who is opposing this regime even behind the, uh, even the, behind the bars, and she's paying a high price uh, for this. So. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, women, our women are strong, our women are uh, powerful, uh, but of course, you know, the unit of uh, our of our movement of democratic forces is, uh, is uh, consists of not only of women, but also of men, and our task is to unite around uh, our, like, uh, common goals, not around personalities about persons, but about our goals. Thank you. Uh, just changing the subject a little bit about the Ryan Air flight that was grounded and to use to arrest a, a, a person that Lukashenko was opposed to. Can you talk a little bit about his use of uh, transnational repression and if that's being effective or you anticipate it increasing or other authoritarian regimes are kind of copying that pattern of behavior? As I said before, dictators are easily uh, learned from each other. They are uh, you know, learning the tools how to uh, suppress people, how to blackmail uh, neighbors, how to keep uh, democratic countries in stress, how to disperse attention, for example. You know, uh, Ukraine was in focus now. Israel uh, is, uh, is under attack, and it's a task of dictators, you know, to disperse, to disperse intention, not to be concentrated on, on one uh, issue and to exhaust um, uh, democratic countries from, uh, you know, uh, and uh, not to support everybody uh, systematically. And that's why, uh, as I said also before, we don't have to treat symptoms of the disease under what, which name is tyranny, but to uh, treat the, the, the problem itself. You know, if in Belarus we can um, support democratic forces, yes and yes. We can impose new uh, sanctions, uh, but if we, uh, there is loopholes. If this support is not enough to win dictator, so it, it might be endless fight. But we really want to return home. We want to, we want to defeat this regime and build normal, reliable, democratic country. And it's uh, as I said in my speech: your support to us is not charity. We, it's your investment into future uh, security uh, of uh, like uh, the whole world. So help us, uh, you know, <laughs> to help the world be safe. That's true. We need a, a friend in that difficult neighborhood. So by your strengthening your democratic movement, that strengthens our position internationally, too. So, well, thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. I, I now uh, recognize the vice chair of this committee, Mr. Self, for up to five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to I want to follow up on the uh, the nuclear weapons. Uh, we've seen the statements by uh, by Putin. Uh, so forth, but do you, and, and I'm not sure anyone has actually confirmed the presence of uh, tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. Have you seen any evidence that confirms their presence? Actually not. Uh, we uh, know information uh, from open propagandistic resources. They say that the nuclear weapon is already in Belarus, but this uncertainty uh, you know, creates more questions. You, uh, with this uncertainty, regimes uh, keep uh, neighbors and the world in stress. Is the weapon there? Not, you know, we don't know. But what we know for sure is that with the deployment of nuclear weapon, the aim of this deployment is to keep uh, Belarus and people under control to anchor the presence of Russia in our country for many, many years ahead, and also to blackmail uh, neighboring countries. So we don't know for sure. My answer is no. Um, 
I, I read one article that said that uh, they were actually building a new base for it. Uh, are you familiar with that base? And, and is that base been completed, even if we don't know the weapons have moved? And I'm not sure where it is. I can't tell you. No, actually, we don't know. We have heard about this uh, basement. Uh, you know, in Belarus, we have so-called people's intelligence. It's ordinary people who uh, give us information if they see something, you know, is going on. But we haven't get uh, any information about uh, this uh, this basement or deployment of nuclear weapon. You know, I, I really can't, uh, can't confirm, uh, you know, this. Okay, thank you. I think that's uh, instructive to me that it may be all talk and no action. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Self. I now yield up to five minutes to Mr. Wilson from South Carolina. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I call you Madam President. I believe that you were rightfully elected. Uh, and uh, we just so appreciate your courage, uh, your courage, your husband's courage. Uh, we just hope the best for ultimately a free and democratic Belarus. I'm very grateful uh, with my Democrat colleagues to be uh, working with the Friends of Belarus Caucus. Uh, indeed, we look for forward to freedom and democracy in Belarus. Uh, and uh, again, the courage of yourself and uh, your husband uh, just uh, is such an inspiration. And I've been happy to actually be with you in Vienna, uh, to be here with you in Washington and uh, in, in my service, um, everywhere I go, uh, people are just so impressed uh, by your personal commitment and courage. You're an inspiration, obviously, for the people of Belarus, and then, hey, ultimately an inspiration for the people of Russia itself, uh, that they too, under the oppression of war criminal Putin, one day there will be a free and democratic Russia, uh, which I've visited many times, and uh, I have been so impressed, but so sad, uh, to see a great country uh, held back and oppressed uh, by a, a dictator. With that in mind, also I want to congratulate you. The BBC has recognized this British broadcasting company. You as uh, one of the top 100 women in the world. Uh, you're in the top uh, Bloomberg uh, 50. Additionally, the European Parliament. Uh, in 2020, you received the Sakharov Prize, one of the highest uh, awards, uh, which uh, indicates, indeed, as we saw the Soviet Union uh, liberated and uh, sadly uh, going backwards simultaneously, uh, that's such a uh, recognition in 2022, the Charlemagne Prize. And then I was recently grateful to be with you here in Washington to receive the recognition with the National Endowment for Democracy. And so uh, your leadership is just so uh, inspiring uh, for the people around the world, for the people of uh, Belarus. With that in mind, sadly, when the uh, war criminal Putin invaded Ukraine February 24, 2022, a large contingent of its forces uh, staged an advance on Belarusian territory to invade from the north. And, and I, hey, I saw the consequence. I was at Bucha, Ukraine, where I saw the site of where whole families had their hands tied behind their back and then they were shot in the head and buried in shallow graves. Uh, these troops had come from the direction of Belarus. With that in mind, Lukashenko has also provided bases and logistical support, including ammunition supplies, to the murdering Russian military. What other help has uh, or Lukashenko provided, and what can we do uh, to uh, deter this? Uh, so till now, uh, Lukashenko's regime provided Russia with the missiles, Belarusian missiles, tanks, uh, military equipment. Uh, also, Belarus modernizes uh, military equipment and repairing uh, damaged uh, equipment. Uh, also, they provide intelligence information for uh, Russia. Uh, also, Belarus provides facilities to train Russian soldiers uh, on our land. And, uh, of course, the Convention on S of Sanctions we have discussed before allowing Russia to buy staff for the war and for military through Belarus. Um, uh, also, uh, Belarus, uh, sometimes Russian, um, uh, Russian uh, missiles fly over Belarus territory, is like providing airspace for attacking Ukraine. Um, also, at the moment, it's up to 200 Wagner uh, thugs uh, stay on our territory and up to 2,000 uh, Belarusian soldiers. Um, uh, also, uh, so last attack from our country was uh, in October 2022, 
but it uh, doesn't mean that our country can be again uh, used uh, for attacking Ukraine. And Lukashenko will like uh, will provide our territory for for doing this. Uh, another uh, atrocity uh, is the kidnapping of children. Uh, the Nazis ki kidnapped children in Poland to Germanize. Now we have uh, war criminal Putin uh, kidnapping children. Are there any children that have been kidnapped from Ukraine currently in Belarus? Uh, we have proofs uh, about at least 200, uh, 2,000 children that have been kidnapped from occupied territories and brought to Belarus. And we have uh, documents uh, approving this. And uh, that's why uh, Lukashenko uh, has to be given arrest warranty for this crime, abduction of Ukrainian children. And I ask you to help us in uh, launching a special investigation on this crime of Lukashenko in ICC. Again, thank you so much. And it's been such an honor to be with you in Vienna, Washington, Copenhagen. And then I, I'm so grateful for the support of the Republic of Lithuania. Uh, gosh, they're there 110 percent of the time because they have seen uh, oppression in the past and they want to see a liberated uh, Belarus. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 thank you. I now yield five minutes to Chairman Smith from New Jersey. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Sikahanuskaya, thank you for your courageous leadership, but it's not just that. It's selfless. In the entirety of this hearing today, not once did you mention that a kangaroo court in March convicted you of trying to influence or overthrow a, a, uh, an election. It's called, it's called an election. <laughs> um, and you were sentenced to 15 years by Lukashenko's dictatorship. Um, you never even mentioned it. <laughs> you know, I mean, that speaks so much about you um, and your courage. And all of us here on this panel on both sides of the aisle are deeply concerned about you and your well-being. Uh, and we know that you know, increasingly Lukashenko uh, is going after the diaspora, both in Europe as well as in the United States. Matter of fact, the European Council on Foreign Relations did a piece in January uh, called A Prison of the Mind, Lukashenko's Pursuit of Exiled Belarusians. Belarusians. And, um, you know, we know that nobody does that better than people like Xi Jinping and others, uh, he especially, uh, uh, trying to, to harass and do worse to the diaspora here and in Europe and around the world. And I'm just wondering if you might want to speak to this. I mean, another reason why TSP, uh, Temporary Protective Status, TPS, is so important, um, uh, but it's only a part of it. I think our FBI and others in Europe uh, need to be uh, law enforcement even more energized to ensure the protection of uh, the Belarusian people who are out of the country, uh, and you especially. I mean, you're, you're an icon of, of freedom. Um, you know, we got to, you know, let everyone know that in, 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 um, in Lukashenko's dictatorship that we care deeply about you and are watching and hoping and praying that, that you remain completely safe uh, in your very, very courageous work. So I um, maybe speak to the diaspora, your own uh, bogus conviction by by that court in March. Uh, and finally, in terms of visiting uh, political prisoners, we always, you know, count on the ICRC and others to, to go. Apparently that hasn't been happening. And then you have the, the outrage where the Global Red Cross suspended the Belarusian chapter of the ICRC after its chief boasted of bringing in Ukrainian children. That came out uh, just a couple days ago. I mean, that is outrageous for the ICRC uh, to have facilitated and boasted uh, about that kidnapping of Ukrainian children. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, you know, since the uh, beginning of, uh, of detaining people in Belarus, we asked uh, Red Cross, International Red Cross, to uh, pay attention to this issue. We are absolutely sure that Red Cross 
will find opportunity to demand access to political prisons for them to see how uh, how people are being tortured inside our countries, inside our uh, in in Belarusian prisons. But no uh, like results uh, of this work. We have never heard about public demand uh, of access to uh, political prisoners, and uh, Belarusian Red Cross is absolutely pro-regime institution and the leader of uh, Belarusian Red Cross uh, went to Belarus to occupy territories and he was participating in the production of Ukrainian children and uh, as far as uh, I know uh, now ICRC stopped any relationship with Belarusian Red Cross and stopped financing of uh, this organization uh, because of uh, uh, they uh, they uh, didn't agree to fire this leader of Belarus and Red Cross, uh, but still they need to, uh, they have to continue their support to demand access to people. You know, people are really dying in prisons, and it's in their mandate, you know, to interfere uh, in such issues where people um, uh, people are abused, uh, people are being tortured. And uh, I, if you can help us, you know, to ask them to do it publicly not just to send uh, uh, letters on the carpet, but to show publicly that they uh, are interested, you know, in, um, in helping our political prisoners. So we'd be really grateful for this. Thank you, and we will follow up on that. And I, again, you still don't mention the fact that this dictatorship has uh, convicted you and sentenced you to 15 years. Again, you're so selfless, um, it's so inspiring. Um, thank you. With no further questions from the members, I want to thank our witness, Ms. Um, uh, Sikanskaya, uh, for your valuable testimony, and the members for their questions. Members of the subcommittee may have some additional written questions uh, for you, and we ask that you respond to these promptly and in writing. Uh, pursuant to community rules, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, extraneous material for the record subject to the length limitations. Without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you.